Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Supporting People with Speech, Language and Communication Needs in the Justice System. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you also to the Association of Youth Offending Team Managers for co-hosting this with us. If you use Twitter, do join the conversation using a Twitter hashtag, hashtag RCSLT webinar and hashtag RCSLT justice box. <clears throat> My name is Claire Moser and I am the policy advisor here at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. I will be chairing today. I am delighted to welcome and introduce our two speakers, Diz Minnett, Operational Manager at Milton Keynes Youth Offending Team, and Lisa Ogden, Highly Specialist Speech and Language Therapist at Sutton Youth Offending Team. Today's webinar will be 45 minutes long and there will be time for questions at the end. During the webinar, you can use a Q&A button on the webinar software to submit a question for the panel. You can submit a question at any time. We may not be able to answer all the questions in the Q&A at the end, but we will do our best to make sure that an answer goes online. This event is being recorded and it will go online on the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists website as soon as possible after the events. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat button on the webinar software to send a message to Kaylee, who is on hand to help today. Also, your feedback is important to us, so please do fill out the short survey, which will pop up on your screen at the end. It will only take a couple of minutes to fill in. You will see the aims and objectives on your screen. It is our hope that at the end of this webinar, you will be much more familiar with the speech, language and communication needs and how these affect people who are at risk of offending or who offends. We have done our best to decrease acronyms where possible, but we have listed a few important ones on this slide. You may find it helpful to revisit this slide at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Diz. Thanks very much, Claire. Right. Um, just to get us started, why do we have speech and language therapy within youth offending teams? I think it's useful to have a kind of recap to get a sense of what the purpose of it is. Well, <clears throat> we know that speech, language and communication needs are effectively a hidden disability. Children with these, young, these difficulties find difficulty in expressing themselves and understanding others and they often cannot understand having difficulties around processing information. There are high numbers of young people with speech language communication needs in the youth justice system and the vast majority of these do not have their needs previously identified before they come into the system. The longer the difficulties remain unrecognised, the greater the potential negative repercussions for the young person and wider society. In other words, the ripple effect of that need. So, What's the research that sits behind this and, and what are the evidence that we have? Well, 55% of four-year-olds in areas of deprivation can have speech, language or communication needs, and that compares to between 5 and 8% in the general population. Significantly greater number of children with those needs at age four by the age of eight will have developed behavioural problems, and children with communication needs are at greater risk of social exclusion in adolescence and adulthood. If untreated, we can see the trajectory for these children. 33% of them are likely to develop mental illness and over 50% will become involved in criminal activity. And we can see that this, this is further research by the, sorry, further evidence by the research of Burko 10 years on, which identified that 81% of children with emotional and behavioural disorders have unidentified language difficulties. So when you're looking at children, for instance, in pupil referral units, that's a useful starting point to think. And when you move longer and into uh, early adulthood, we know that 88% of unemployed young, young men had communication needs, again compared to 8% in the general population. So what we have is evidence of what Karen Bryan described as the compounding risk model. And this is cumulative. So poor oral language leads to poor literacy skills, which in turn leads to poor educational outcomes, difficulties with mental health and beha poor behavioural outcomes, and then this becomes compounded within offending and the longer it goes on, the greater the risk. So this uh, we've illustrated through the, the road to nowhere. This is the, the youth, young, the, sorry, the trajectory the young person is going through as those needs 
ceased to be identified all the way through the system prior to coming into the youth justice system and even once they're actually within it. So the consequences are far reaching. We also know through the research that Karen Bryan did that over 60% of young people who are in the youth justice system have speech, language and communication needs. And when we look at uh, significant parts of within the system, so for instance, within the secure estate, we identify that those needs in Karen Bryan's research was up as far as 90% and in some recent research in, in a secure training sentence that identified 72%. And out of the young people looked at, which was 109, there were only two who had previously been identified as having speech language and communication needs. So it's not just that the need is there, it's the fact that it's not being picked up. And if it's not being picked up, we can't inform the way that we're working with young people. So as I say, in secure settings, we, we identified that 60 percent, uh, uh, sorry, 60 to 90 percent have these needs. And when you then look at adult prisoners, again, further research identified that 80 percent of those had speech, language and communication needs. So it's not something that if unaddressed will resolve itself over time. It's likely to stay there as a compounding issue. And it's a, an issue that appears within both the youth and the adult criminal justice system. So what are the particular challenges for these young people? Well, they, they're harder to engage. They don't understand the words used. They often lack understanding of time concepts and calendars, which has an issue in terms of breaching, because if you don't know and, and don't understand when an appointment is and don't have a meaningful sense of time, you're not going to turn up for the appointment. They have problems listening, remembering detail and understanding key elements of spoken language and the need time to formulate verbal responses. So they've got poor non-verbal communication as well, issues around reading and understanding body language and poor eye contact. So what's the on-term impact of this in terms of uh, engaging the young person? Well, obviously, there's a greater risk of breach if the young people do not understand what's expected of them. A lot of the programmes that is, is used within the youth justice system and within the adult system are very language orientated and therefore the young person cannot access this in a meaningful sense. In relation to the sort of background impact, it, background research about this going back some years, we know that this also has an impact on the way that they're perceived by magistrates. So for instance, going back to the um, audit office uh, examination of the youth justice system back in 2004, one of the quotes came out of that was about 80% of magistrates surveyed said that the attitude and demeanor of a young person influences their sentencing decision to some or a greater extent. So in other words, the way these young people are presenting within court affects the way that magistrates and judges then behave towards them. If a young person is inarticulate, inhibited or lacks understanding, which is not uncommon amongst teenagers, this may lead to misunderstandings and even the passing of an inappropriate sentence. And one of the lines that I've used often with magistrates is that if you are dealing with a young person in front of you who would you believe is operating at the level of a 17 year old, but that the speech, language and communication assessment identifies in key areas is actually behaving at the or responding at the age of a six or seven year old. That information in and of itself makes a difference about the way that you perceive that child. So what can we do? We've identified the elephant in the room. How are we going to address it? Well, within Milton Keynes, um, once we became aware of this, we actually looked at the whole core of the way that we developed our system and identified that speech language communication need because it affects the majority of the children in the system is actually a core need. This is not about adding on something extra to the yacht. This has to be at the very centre of what you are delivering uh, in your core service to young people that you're working with. So therefore, we assess everybody. We operate a system which is called screening out, not screening in. If the majority of people are affected, it's illogical to screen them in. If you or I uh, had a particular type of cancer for which there was a 60, 70 percent prevalence within our family, we would be asking to be assessed. We wouldn't be asking for a screening tool to see whether we might have it. So to, to carry on with the analogy, within the yacht, the speech and language therapist assesses every young person. They also train all of the staff and all of the volunteers within the yacht. This means that the individual and all the staff are actively supported. 
so the whole yacht, not just the professional staff, understand how to engage with young people and parents with speech language and communication need. And the speech and language therapists who are based within the team are also linked into the wider speech and language services and special education needs services within Milton Keynes. The speech and language therapy assessments are provided to court along with the pre-sentence report. So it details the, the child's full level of needs right across the spectrum, which again has had a significant impact in reducing custodial sentences in both the youth and the Crown Court. By assessing all the young people in the system, we avoid the potential dangers of under-identification of needs. And it also means that we can address the issues around time concepts in putting into place supports to enable young people to engage with their order, to avoid breach and to ensure that as many barriers as possible are removed. And hence the speech and language therapist in Milton Keynes developed the Time Matters resource materials, which actually work on specific techniques to help young people increase their understanding of time concepts. We know from wider research that by both the DfE and MOG that was published around the time of the Taylor Review, that there are disproportionately high number of young people with special education needs and speech and language needs within the youth justice system. However, that research is still only relying on the level of young people who have been identified. We know speech and language is a, a hidden disability, so we therefore know that, if anything, that is still a significant underrepresentation. On the basis of the research in Milton Keynes, we can be confident that the figures quoted are actually around about 65%, which is the number that we've identified in the last 10 years of research. Recently, we've had analysis of young people at risk of child sexual exploitation and wider criminal exploitation. And through that, we identified that of those young people identified who had been through the yacht and had also had speech and language assessments, that 92% of them had speech language communication needs. So again, we've got clear evidence that this is a need that's associated with vulnerability, which puts these children at greater risk of being exploited by other people, including involvement in gangs and county lines. So having established that the, there are safeguarding concerns in relation to this, we, we actually have gone out of our way to ensure that we are looking to, to train and support all of our key partners within the children's social, um, children's social care and within education. Therefore, the yacht in conjunction with partners in specialist senior education psychology department and other colleagues within SEND have been delivering training around awareness raising and identification of speech language communication needs in SEND. And this training goes right across the children's workforce and particularly being targeted towards secondary school SENCOs and other key pastoral staff. The speech and language screening tool, which has been incorporated within uh, ASSIP Plus, has been adapted by the Yacht Speech and Language Therapist. So schools can use this as a method of looking at early identification of children in the system. So what's the impact of this in terms of the way that the service is run? Well, for the last three or four years, the reoffending rate for Milton Keynes has been consistently within the lowest 10 within the within England and our current reoffending rate is 26% after two years and that compares to a national rate of around 41%. We've increased the level of engagement and reduced the number of breaches as a direct result of identifying the issue around the time concepts and putting in appropriate support. We have systemically supported all of the other key services that are working with children so that it isn't just the way that the yacht work, it's the way that schools work, it's the way that children's social care work, it's the way that the court works, magistrates, judges. This information goes right across the board. So on the basis of the, uh, the positive results that we got with the mainstream yacht, we've expanded this approach to work in relation to prevention and early intervention and have been funded by NHS England to do a specialist um, piece of research on this and uh, uh, provision around those at risk of coming into the system. And the other area that needs to be explored further, not just locally, but nationally, is around those children who go into pupil referral units, given that we know that of children with behavioural difficulties, 88% are likely to have speech, language and communication needs. So again, this is an area that needs further um, exploration both locally and nationally in terms of how we prevent those children falling through the net and ending up in the youth justice system. So I think I touched on this earlier, but in terms of the, the research in Milton Keynes, we've now been measuring this for 10 years 
And of all those young people assessed, 65% have been identified as having speech language communication needs. These are children coming through the York. And since the introduction of this, this model, we've consistently reduced the level of reoffending. So it provides a window into the child which enables greater engagement. It identifies other unrecognised needs that the child may have around you know, special educational needs, learning difficulties around trauma and loss. So this is not just a methodology for labelling the child. This is a window into how to engage effectively with that child. And now, without further ado, over to Lisa. Hello everybody, thank you Diz. So um, Diz has um, looked at all the research available um, to say why, why we're having this webinar. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about as a speech and language therapist, what I do and how my role is in the yacht. So um, sometimes speech and language therapists will say, you know, well, what kind of needs are we looking at? And the answer is you're looking at all the same needs that you might have been looking at in preschool clinic situation poor concentration difficulties, maybe as a result of trauma or ADHD, but also just of not understanding what's being said, so concentration goes. Limited understanding of spoken language, particularly around vocabulary. The vocabulary levels are really low for this cohort of young people. Um, Diz has already mentioned not understanding vocabulary to do with time. There might also be um, the vocabulary around obligation. You are required to, you need to comply what does that mean? Many of our young people don't know. They also don't know the criminal, the vocabulary of the criminal justice system, which of course puts them at a disadvantage when being thrown into a new system. They often have very poor working memory, again, often linked with witnessing domestic violence, and poor expressive language, um, it might be word finding difficulties. They may have as we've already touched on a very limited vocabulary, but their narrative skills may be very poor as well. And if you can't sequence this, then that, then the other, actually, how are you thinking through the consequences of your actions? Very often there's a poor development of empathy. Um, and I think this touched on social skills issues. So inability to think about hidden meanings, um, inability to infer, and that actually makes this population very vulnerable to exploitation. Um, then there are also, you know, stammering and um, even selective mutism recently. So what about the role? The role is very varied. Um, there's screening and assessment we've talked about. There's also one-to-one -one therapy or possibly group work, depending on the setup of the yacht. Um, a lot of our work is to do with making information accessible to young people, but also to their families. If we think about the intergenerational cycle of um, language and communication needs, we know that a lot of families don't understand the words being used either. There's staff training, which we'll come to in a bit. And I do a lot of work on sort of consultation, advice, information, strategies, talking about particular cases and seeing how we can help. So in terms of screening, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists have worked with the Ministry of Justice to ensure that screening of speech, language and communication needs is now part of the statutory assessment, both in yachts and in custody. In yachts, it's part of the Asset Plus, which is mentioned, and in custody, there's the Comprehensive Health Assessment Tool, the chat. Now, in your yacht, the speech and language therapist can do the screening, maybe with the case manager present, which is really useful for them to see what's going on. Somewhat yachts work with um, workers being trained by the speech and language therapist to carry out the screening and then refer, referring to the speech and language therapist to discuss the findings. Clearly, there needs to be some very good um, training before that can happen. There, we also look at um, talking mats, which some therapists will know, which is basically a picture format I'll show you in a minute. Um, Self-evaluation questionnaires. What do the young people think about their own communication? Um, and then restorative justice is a process that requires both parties to listen to each other. So this is the person that has committed the offence and also the victim. Um, and it's a very useful way of um, resolving some aspects of um, the harm done. But 
The young people need to be able to talk about their thoughts and feelings at the time and how they are the same or different now. And the aim is for each party to feel heard. Now, obviously, not all young people have the necessary skills to do this face to face, um, but that doesn't mean that restorative approach can't be taken, but just that adaptations may need to be used. So um, there can be um, formal assessment of speech, language and communication needs. And the way we work is we think about actually how what is the purpose of that assessment? Who is it for? How useful is it for that young person at that current time in their life? Sometimes a, a formal assessment is really, really useful because of um, the link with um, SEN. But if they are into work, then maybe we need to think about that. Um, so it's just being flexible about that. Training, as I mentioned, is a huge part. Um, so obviously we train the team. But Diz mentioned volunteers, so um, panel members are volunteers, people who carry out reparation projects with young people, and then training to partner, partnership agencies like appropriate adults, the police, court staff, but also parents, letting parents on, know what these needs are and understanding how they can alter what they're doing to make a difference to the young people. And indeed, as Diz mentioned, training to schools. Um, within Sutton, this tends to be very young person specific, so we'll go and have a meeting with all the teachers that work with a young, particular young person. However, informal training is really important and actually, in my experience, has some of the biggest impact. I'm embedded in the team and that makes um, means that there are many opportunities for discussions, joint sessions where learning can really take place. When I first started in Sutton, there was a worker who was very friendly personally, but really didn't feel that I had anything to add to her knowledge. And she was directed by management to join me for an assessment of a young person. Watching him really try to concentrate and answer questions about what he'd heard led her to a light bulb moment. <gasps> He really can't listen. I've been telling him he needs to listen for months, but now I can see that he actually can't. And that was brilliant because that changed the way she was working with him um, and changed her understanding of the usefulness within of a speech and language therapist within the youth justice setting. Um, she did give me permission to share that. Another example is a worker where I always arrive with a pen and paper to draw out the message. And the day that worker arrived with a pen and paper was quite a significant day, like my job here is done. But these things are really important. OK, we do lots of sharing information and um, sharing information to courts is a very um, important part of that. And we'll come back to talking mats and communication passports. Here we go. So here's a talking mat. So basically, the young person has put on the left the things that they're not very good at or don't feel very confident with and on the right things that they feel that they are good at. So that then is them self-assessing and gives a, um, a look at their strengths and weaknesses. Clearly, that wouldn't be all we would do, but it's really important. Um, sometimes people say, oh, no, well, you can't use photos with, you know, 17 year olds. They won't accept it. It's patronizing. Not true. Not true at all. Um, if it's presented as part of what we do, then there's no problem. This is a communication passport. It was sent to school and it's um, looking at the things the young person finds difficult, what they think helps them, what it means for them and what doesn't help. Um, so we use that with certain young people. Promoting good communication skills is an essential part of the job. Um, some speech and language therapists give a tip of the week. Um, we at Sutton Yacht, we look at words of the month. So these are two words where I ask the workers to teach them to the young people if the young people don't already know them, because we know that their vocabulary is very low. Um, we might be making sure that the youth offending team literature is accessible. Um, things that say prior to and um, subsequently, what does that mean? Young people and their families don't understand those words. Um, there might be individual work with young people and it might be um, visual timetables or teaching strategies like comic strip conversations. Um, so there is um, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists have developed the box, which is online training. It's free 
and um, it's really very good. And our reparation and victim worker has completed it, despite the fact that she works alongside me. She's always keen for some extra knowledge. And she said she found it really useful as a reminder, but also seeing things from a slightly different perspective. So I would highly recommend that. And the link is there. So what are the benefits for speech and language therapists working with the youth offending teens? I think that you're truly part of a multidisciplinary team um, being embedded the way I am. And it's great that young people who have struggled to engage previously can finally access a service. Um, you see the young people acting with other people, which of course gives you lots of information about them. And there's lots of opportunities for joint working and being creative. And I guess for me, um, it's less restrictive in that many systems, particularly in the NHS, are like three strikes and you're out. Um, but we can keep trying to engage those young people. For the staff, I did ask my colleagues for these. Um, there's the way that they can communicate, knowledge about the way they can communicate with young people. And the police talked about gaining trust with the young people because they weren't alienating them by using language that they didn't understand. Um, I think that the staff feel that they're better understand, they have better understanding of the barriers to engagement and how to overcome them. And it brings another perspective to planning and strategy meetings. And this might mean that you're actually advocating better for a young person within children's social care or in court. Um, it's a great understand, greater understanding of why young people react the way they do. And so for the young people themselves, the benefits are that let their needs are identified. Um, maybe they get further referrals onto CAMS, perhaps for a neurodevelopmental assessment. Um, but we're working on their speech and language needs to reduce the barriers and increase their confidence. They understand their court order better, and hopefully that means they don't reoffend. This is evidence that that's true. Um, vulnerabilities are better identified, so we are better able to safeguard them from exploitation. And um, parents, we can help parents to understand their child's needs and change their communication styles. So there are challenges. Um, when you belong to two teams, you know, you, I'm embedded there, but I, I, I get paid by another organisation. It's a bit like, which team do I belong to? Um, and, you know, you can feel that you're the only person in York that speaks your language. However, after eight years, actually, they all speak my language now. Um, so some yachts um, can find it difficult to work with outside agencies, but actually I think that most yachts are multidisciplinary teams now. Um, obviously you need managers who can be pragmatic in the sense of, you know, not needing perhaps to do both lots of mandatory training, etc. Um, and it's just to be aware that integrating new specialties takes time and we need to, be, to build relationships. So why do I do this job? Reaching the hard to reach, it's excellent. Teenagers are fabulous, mostly. Um, and I think that this is a job that I can use a whole range of skills like counselling and confidence building skills that I have developed over my years of being a speech and language therapist. Love being part of the team, love feeling like I can make a difference and being able to be really creative in the way I work um, really suits me. So now I'm going to hand back over to Claire. Thank you very much, Disney, for those excellent presentations. Uh, just to let you all know that on your screen you have got some further resources which might be useful if you want some more background information on speech, language and communication needs. Um, I'm going to take some questions and answers now in the time we have remaining to us. Uh, we've had a lot of questions around where to go for further information. So I just wanted to let you know that when we publish the webinar, we will also be publishing some further links and references with it. So if you want to be signposted to resources or further information, we'll make sure that everyone joining us today does receive that. Now, uh, first question, I'm, I'm going to send this to both Diz and Lisa. We've had a lot of comments from people saying, I don't have an SRT in my yachts. Where do I go for support? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Um, you can try your local speech and language service um, depending on what who they are commissioned to work with and and what the remit of their, their commissioning is but uh, my experience is that a lot of the time the answer is that those resources are not 
often accessible in terms of the, the way that you, I don't know what your experience has been, Lisa. No, no, I think that's right. I think it very much depends um, with the commissioning model now that you are commissioned to provide X service and therefore adding something different doesn't come very easily. It's possible, but obviously it has to go back to the commissioners. Yeah, I think it's, it's very much, I would, uh, I suppose I'd flip the question around and say, uh, the most effective way is to start looking at what the the national research is. I'm quite happy if people want to contact me and I can send you some of the research from Milton Keynes, which I've done to a number of youth offending teams around the country who have then used it to support and evidence um, getting their own commission services in by demonstrating the kind of the impact, not only of the way that the service can work, but also actually of the level of need that we've identified as well. And also within the box online training that we mentioned earlier, there is a module on commissioning. And um, so it's really good, good to look at that. Uh, following up that question, Lisa, you just mentioned the box. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about it, just to summarise it up for some of our people attending today who don't know what it is, please? Okay, so the box is an online training and it's in a number of modules. So there's a module on what is speech, language and communication needs, um, how can you notice them, how can you screen for them, what can you do about them. Each module takes about 10 minutes, I would say, um, and it's very interactive and it gives you at the end, um, there's some questions to, to see whether or not you've um, picked up everything that's in that module um, and then you can move on to the to the next module. Thank you very much. We've received quite a few questions today from people asking about screening, which I know is a very interesting issue. There's different models that exist. Could you both share in your experience the way that you screen young people or people for speech language communication needs, please? Okay, so um, we, I use a screening tool which has, I mean, it's not published, but speech and language therapists within the justice system share it a lot. Um, and that is, um, it just does some questions on memory, so reading some, some um, information to a young person, asking them questions about it. It looks at their ability to remember their, their vocabulary knowledge, their ability. I mean, you can just say to them, you know, tell me how you play a football game or a pool game. So you, what you're looking for is, you know, I want to know how you play it. How do you win? What, what are the, what's the aim of the game? What are the rules? Um, a young person said to me the other day, you have to stop the other team getting the ball. Clearly, that's not a very comprehensive narrative about how to play football. So you can get some idea about their abilities there. But also, I think it's really important to do something like the talking mats where you're asking young people, what are you good at? How easy is this for you? Um, and there's um, Ealing did a project called Yo Salt, and it's still out there. It can be looked up. There's a they have a um, 15 questions that you can use to ask young people um, about about their language and communication needs, and that's quite useful too. And I think in, in Milton Keynes, we actually assess rather than screen every young person, and it's the, the speech and language therapist that does that. Uh, and I think that that you know comes down to the the point that I was sort of saying earlier, which is that. The, to my mind, the screening process is the, is the starting point and, and we operate a model which is screening out rather than screening in. So if the majority of the young people in the system have this need, it's more logical that rather than trying to screen children in, which is that the way the system is currently structured, so you've got a screening tool within, within Asset Plus which is trying to screen these children in, that actually we need a paradigm shift. We need to actually recognise that because it's the majority, you should actually be looking to say, OK, who doesn't it affect? But you should structure your service so it actually meets their needs, whether, you, whether you've identified those needs or not, ultimately. In terms of the actual assessment tools that the speech and language therapists use, uh, KELF4 is the main one, and they use a number yeah. of different subtests within KELF4. And the advantage of some of those, uh, they also use TROG, but KELF4 is quite useful in as much as there are ways of getting uh, age equivalent scores out of it in terms of for some of the subtests. And I know some of the speech and language therapists will be pulling their hair out at this point and jumping up and down saying, oh, that's a bit um, of a in, improper use of it. However, when you are trying to get a message across to magistrates and judges around the level of functioning of, of a particular child in key areas, 
that's really useful because as, as I illustrated earlier, if you're talking about a 17 year old who actually in some of their levels of understanding is actually operating at the level of a five or six year old, that's absolutely crucial that a court understand that, particularly now that the sentencing guidelines have changed and those are key factors that magistrates and judges need to take into account. And in addition, you can look at their working memory because that is key yeah. for their ability to function in school mm. and speaks to why a lot of our young people, they're very hypervigilant and their working memory is very poor. And that is why they are struggling in school and why sometimes schools are seeing lots of behaviours that they can't you know, understand why that's happening because to some extent these kids are quite quote unquote bright. Um, but actually, if they're very hypervigilant and their working memory is very poor, that is going to affect all aspects of learning. That's great. Thank you both very much. We've had a couple of questions in um, directed towards you, Lisa, about different ways of working. And um, some of the speech and language therapists joining us today are asking about the difference in you talked about being embedded within Sutton Youth Offending Team. And I know some speech and language therapists provide more of an in reach service. Could you just describe to everyone listening today what the difference is between the two ways of working, please? So I think I actually sit um, in the youth offending team for all the time that I'm there, which is three days a week. And interestingly, having done that for since 2010, um, I am now also sitting within children's social care. So the um, need for or the recognition of what I am giving that service is very useful and has gone sideways. If you are not embedded, then you are popping in for an hour or two or maybe a morning or maybe a day, but you're not necessarily part of the team. So being embedded, I go to all the team meetings um, or the practice meetings. So anything that I have learnt at training or um, has come up as a point of interest through, I don't know, the um, Royal College's newsletter or something, then I actually can have a forum for talking about that to the team. I'm also there on a day to day basis. So these young people don't always turn up when they're supposed to, but if you can say, well, actually, do you know what? He didn't turn up Tuesday. He's here now. Can we grab him? Can we do something with him now? Can we do a joint session? And doing joint sessions, I mean, joint reparation sessions, I've done, you know, baking and um, things like that, litter picking, actually just being able to say to the people that I'm working with, do you see when I said that and he said that, what did you think then? What happened then? So there's an education that goes alongside and being embedded, I think is just, it's, it's a much better way of working if possible. That's great, thank you. Uh, Diz, I wanted to ask you, because um, we have some new training team managers joining us today, could you provide some advice or some actions for them if they don't have a speech and language therapist what would you recommend they could do to get one uh speak to me um <laughs> number one come to me i'll give you lots of evidence i'll give you um lots of presentations that i can sort of share that gives you clues as to how to go about collecting your evidence um i think that that is yeah it's, it's a real sort of challenge here because the, the issue is if you haven't got, as we didn't have a speech and language therapist initially, um, then you've got to get your evidence in terms of, of doing it, which is why I, I initially managed to get the, the Youth Justice Board to uh, um, allow me to use one of their grant fundings in, a, in a, uh, a totally different way to pay for a speech and language therapist for four months to therefore get that person to assess um and no, a lot of the young people that we were working with and i focused that assessment on the areas i expected to find greatest need so those who young people who have been neat the urging young people with most entrenched offending or any history of sort of falling out of school uh, i think that that's the kind of key bit is is sometimes it's a case of even if you can only identify a small pocket of money that will enable you to buy somebody in to do that initial collecting some of your evidence because once you've started to give some evidence you can then build on that without the evidence you can go to the national evidence you can look to other areas who've got speech and language therapists and i would say find out around the country who has and talk to them so don't just you know come to me speak to other people and find out what they did um and then use the the, the bits that's suitable for your local authority 
That's great. Thank you very much, Diz. Uh, Elise, a question for you. We've got quite a few SLTs who are very interested in working um, across the justice system in different roles. And they're wondering, is there anywhere you could signpost them where they could look for job opportunities? Um, this is a tricky one. Sometimes um, Bulletin, um, Royal College Bulletin has um, these jobs available. Um, and I think that that's definitely always worth a look. Um, and also NHS, um, where, uh, NHS jobs, whatever it's called, they often have a lot um, that come through there. So it's definitely worth looking. Um, I mean, one of the things that I did was I looked at all the evidence around the sort of national and international evidence and went to my local yacht and sort of talked to them and just kind of um, got them interested. So I think that's that's a really useful way as well. Um, we the Royal College's SEN, so we are the Criminal Justice and Secure Settings SEN, and it's national. Jobs sometimes come out through there. They won't be the only place. They will be advertised elsewhere. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you if you know a friendly speech and language therapist in youth justice who can pass you out anything they see as well, that might be useful. That's great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, we've got about three minutes left remaining, so I'd like to ask an open question to both Diz and Lisa. Could you both give to all our delegates listening a take home message? What would you summarise if you wanted to pass one thing on to them? Uh, I suppose to summarise is that approaching special education needs and speech language communication needs within a yacht is actually, it's a, you need a systemic approach. It's not what happens in the yacht, it's what happens with all the partner agencies as well so it's linking into children's social care it's linking into schools it's linking into SCND and I think it's uh, I don't know if I covered it but all of our assessments of young people are shared with all the relevant professionals who are also working with that child so be that within school be that in children's social care etc so that it changes the way that everybody works with that child not just the way that the yacht works with that child I would agree and I guess from a very practical um, point of view for any yacht out there who are listening you know you might not have a speech and language therapist yet but you can start to think really carefully about what are the words I'm using how common are those words instead of saying required to what about need um, so just really thinking about those words um, for the people on the ground, but definitely we think we need to start looking at the links between behaviour and communication and really getting those communication needs understood. That's great. Thank you both, Diz and Lisa. Well, I see that we're almost out of time. Uh, I think that's provided lots of food for thought for everyone today. I'd like to thank Diz and Lisa again for joining us. They've been excellent presenters. And thank you again to the Association of Youth Offending Team Managers for co-hosting this. Just to remind everyone that we have got the Twitter hashtag, so please do use them. This will be recorded. It will go online. So if you've missed the beginning or you've missed the end, please don't worry. All the information will be on the RCSLT website. A short survey is going to pop up on your screen in a minute, so please don't go before it does. It will only take you about two minutes to complete, and we do love to receive your feedback. I'd like to say thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>